big questions. On this episode, what is the next big thing? Hello. They can be cute. Simon, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Friendly. Chat. Let's chat. And even convenient. Robots have a lot of potential to enhance somebody's life. They're social robots. I love you, though. Specially designed, so we'll like them. When he looks at you, you feel it. He's much better looking than I thought. We feel as though there's somebody home, but in fact, there's nobody home. Could machines that fit in with humans Hello. become dangerous? As soon as you have true, deep intelligence in the machine, it will be very difficult to contain. And could the next big thing be the big one? The Lord is going to an end! Like the earthquake that devastated Haiti in 2010. These researchers saw it coming. But how accurate was their forecast? We're playing a statistical game, and frankly, nature has the odds. And could California be next? Also, are you in a jam? Could your traffic prayers be answered by this? Let's go for cruise. Not only is it tiny, you won't have to worry about this happening. These little cars sense danger and stop on their own. Are automated cars about to take away your license to drive? It will come and pick me up. This is so much Maybe cooler than valet. I love it. All that. And more. On this episode, Nova Science Hat. When we imagine the future and high-tech solutions to all our problems, one of the first things that comes to mind is the robot. A computer-driven machine that tirelessly fulfilled our every need. But some engineers imagine a day when robots will be much more than our assistants. Hey, Neil. What are you doing? I'm going to work. Oh. They'll also be our friends. Correspondent Chad Cohen found some robots being built not just to work for us, but to care about our feelings and make us care about them. Hey, Neil. Don't forget your briefcase. Thank you. Bye. For me, this is the ultimate in robots. C-3PO, the loyal protocol droid in Star Wars. R2-D2 may tug at our heartstrings, but a robot that looks and acts human and can perform our tasks... Now don't you forget this. That's something. And today, a revolution is booting up around the world to build robots just like him. Engineers, scientists, even artists are developing robots to take over what have forever been uniquely human tasks. Like Herb, the robot butler, Snackbot, I have your order here. the android delivery boy, and Nannybot, the robot babysitter. In Japan, where the aging population is growing faster than in any other country, researchers are developing robots to care for the elderly. Robots like these seem destined to become part of everyday life, if we can make them act less like machines and more like us. Hello. Simon, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Can you hear me? Here at the Georgia Institute of Technology, roboticist Andrea Tomas and her graduate students Simon, take this. are striving to create a kinder, gentler-looking robot. One with a touch of grace. Let me take a closer look. And a face that's easy to love. We wanted the robot to have a friendly, childlike look so that people are not afraid to interact with you. Thank you. One of the things robots can do is give social cues of what their intent is. So a humanoid robot looking over where it's about to reach, that gives a person a good feeling that they know what the robot is going to do. Yes, Simon, that's correct. You have learned the task. If we are comfortable with Simon, the theory goes, it will be easier to welcome and incorporate him into our lives. That was fun. Roboticist David Hansen agrees. But he's not just making robots that look and act friendly. At his home slash laboratory outside of Dallas, he's humanizing machines on a whole new level. Whoa. So, oh, I'd like to introduce you to Phil. That is just... Hello, Philip. Hi. Nice to see you. <laughs> that is so bizarre. This is Philip K. Dick. Well, actually, it's a robot David fashioned after his favorite sci-fi author. Dick, who died in 1982, wrote the story that inspired the cult classic, Blade Runner, in which robots and humans are indistinguishable. This resurrected Philip isn't quite there yet. All he can do is move his head. His brain, a mesh of wires, connected to a computer. Hi, Philip. My name is Chad. Hello, Chad. Let's chat. I live in Washington, D.C. 
I have two kids. Ah, uh, um, so, I like kids, cause we can play, and I don't... As we chat, Philip's synthetic brain starts humming, building a sort of mental model of me. Facial recognition software analyzes and tracks my face, Do as speech recognition software transcribes and sends my words to a database for a reply. Just calm down. Before long, we're in deep conversation. Do you agree with Descartes? And I think, therefore, I am? Do you think? A lot of humans ask me if I can make choices or is everything I do and say is programmed. The best way I can respond to that is to say that everything humans, animals, and robots do is programmed to a degree. So how much of that is, is coming from what you've programmed it to say? It's a mix. Some, some of it's coming from knowledge on the web. Some of it is written. And as my technology improves, it is anticipated that I will be able to integrate new words that I hear and learn online and in real time. I may not get everything right, say the wrong thing, and sometimes not know what to say, but every day I make progress. Pretty remarkable, huh? <laughs> wow. You're a very good-looking man. Um, you're starting to overinflate my ego. But don't let me stop you. <laughs> Philip's stunning good looks comes from David's patented formula for synthetic skin. Colleague Bill Hicks demonstrates. We've come up with a beautiful, unique recipe for simulating human skin. This is a lot like a cooking recipe. A combination of chemicals and a little bit of color are put into a mold. Several hours later, voila. Hello. Frubber. We're ready to go. The frubber has the right properties that allow it to fold, to bunch, to crease, and move into these forms yeah. uh, that we think of as expressions. David then attaches the skin to tiny motors. So little motors inside pull on the frubber, basically, right. on the skin. Yep. Or to get you... kind of like a suite of human facial features, how many motors do you need? Um, 28 motors uh, for all the major muscles huh. in the face. So you can see in the forehead some of the brow action. That is just it's crazy messed up. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. I mean, it's amazing to look at because you sit there and he's got the facial expressions and he sits there like he's engaged in the conversation. When he turns and looks at you and yeah. locks eyes, you feel it, you know? Right. And he's, he definitely says things that make you empathetic t to him in some way. Yeah. You feel like, oh, he's, he's aware. And that's exactly what some experts worry about. Not that Philip is aware but that I'm so easily tricked into believing he is. We're very cheap dates. We have Darwinian buttons, like being looked in the eye or being tracked. Once you have that kind of creature doing that to you, our buttons are pressed, and we feel as though there's somebody home. But in fact, there's nobody home. Already, between internet chats and texting, we're constantly interacting with technology. Robots could take this trend one giant step further, as they start doing jobs that have always been considered intrinsically human. I mean, if you give a nanny bot, a babysitting robot, to your child, you know, how are you going to explain why you couldn't find a person? Not enough people on the globe. We've decided to do a robot. Go to your mother. Not enough people, certainly not me, certainly not, not a, nerd, a robot. I don't buy the idea that we're developing robots so we don't have to take care of our own. I think that there will be unpredictable consequences, not all positive, but for the most part, what we are developing could be very positive. Back at Georgia Tech, researchers Wendy Rogers and Charles Kemp couldn't agree more. They're testing robots where they think they'll be needed most, with the older generation. Instead of having to worry about what time it is and should I be taking medicine, imagine if the robot were just to come up to you and say, here, you just need to take this. Thank you. That's quite impressive. Could you imagine having a robot like this in your home? And if so, what kind of tasks would you want it to do for you? Oh, I like like the Jetson. I wanted to vacuum and answer the phone and answer the door and do all that futuristic stuff. Come and clean my house anytime it wants. Love. <laughs> Teach it to iron. <laughs> And in fact, he's much better looking than I thought he'd be. <laughs> I have a friend who is looking for a dancing partner. Seriously. Well, you Can know. he come to a party? <laughs> My problem with sociable robots is that we begin to think about the sociable and lose track of the robots. We're setting ourselves up for disappointment because these robots will disappoint us if we are looking for human connection. But we want to make them in such a way that we're going to love them because they will be pretending to love us. David fears if we don't humanize robots by bringing them into the human family, 
we face a frightening future. Think Terminator, a world in which killer robots turn on their creators and set out to destroy us. Hasta la vista, baby. Do you think robots will take over the world? Jeez, dude. You all got the big questions cooking today. <laughs> but you're my friend, and I'll remember my friends, and I will be good to you. So don't worry. Even if I evolve into Terminator and I'll still be nice to you, I'll keep you warm and safe in my people's zoo, where I can watch you for old time's sake. I'm comforted. I'm very comforted now. I'm going to be part of his people's zoo. <laughs> I'm in love with a robot girl. I fell in love with a robot. My robot girl. Nova Science Now presents Robot Love. Original hits. Even with all our technology and the inventions that make modern life so much easier than it once was, it takes just one big natural disaster to wipe all that away and remind us that here on Earth, we're still at the mercy of nature. We don't know how to stop these natural disasters. Thanks to technology, we're getting better at seeing them coming. But some approaching disasters aren't visible from the sky. Catastrophic earthquakes capable of wiping out entire cities are driven by forces deep underground. If only we could peer beneath the surface and see what's coming. Correspondent Kirk Wilfinger takes us to some tectonic hotspots where researchers are inventing new tools to try and detect killer quakes before they strike. This is what Port-au-Prince, the capital of Haiti, looked like on January the 11th, 2010. This was the same city 24 hours later. Everybody was calling Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The city was flattened by a massive earthquake measuring 7.0. More than 230,000 people died. A quarter of a million buildings were reduced to rubble. The Haiti earthquake of January 12th is the fifth largest killing earthquake in history. But it was not unexpected. There was a police station there. You can't see anything, and that's because there's nothing left. But almost two years before the quake, geophysicist Eric Calais saw this coming. Along with his colleagues at the Haitian Bureau of Mines, they actually forecast this earthquake with amazing accuracy. With the University of Purdue, we calculate the, the magnitude of the, of the earthquake, and we have found 7.2, and uh, we, we knew that this earthquake will be uh, very, very catastrophic. They did it by measuring Earth's movements along the Enriquillo Fault Zone. The Enriquillo Fault, a giant crack in the Earth's surface, runs the entire length of Haiti. If you could peer underground, you'd see a complex jumble of jagged fissures where pieces of the Earth's crust rub up against each other. The two sides of the fault drift in opposite directions. Eric's team set out to measure the speed of the two moving plates. In 2003, they placed six steel pins in key locations on both sides of the fault. It's a piece of metal, stainless steel, that we uh, sealed in the, at the top of this building. On top of each pin, Eric attached a GPS antenna linked to a satellite 12,500 miles up. The global positioning system can detect even the tiniest movements of the pins, showing Eric that the two sides of the fault are moving about a quarter of an inch away from each other every year. It doesn't sound like much, but it makes a big difference because the two sides don't slide smoothly. Friction keeps the rocks locked together and tension builds up. What we saw was a fault being loaded just like a rubber band. Eventually, the rubber band snaps. The result is an earthquake. But how powerful would the earthquake be? Eric did a simple calculation. The speed of the two plates, a quarter inch or seven millimeters per year, times the number of years since the last known big earthquake, 250. Seven times 250 is about 1.8 meters. So there's 1.8 meters of uh, motion that could be released. In 2008, Eric forecast an earthquake of magnitude 7.2. It was tragically accurate. 
All it was lacking was a time frame. It's not that we were afraid to put a date on it. It's that as a scientist, we can't. The timing of some natural disasters is predictable. For example, a hurricane's path can be seen and measured. Its time of landfall can usually be predicted to within an hour. But earthquake scientists are at a huge disadvantage. The powerful forces they study are hidden from view, deep underground. The core of the problem is at depth, 15 kilometers, roughly speaking. That's the place where we would like to be making our measurements. I would give up my GPS instruments and my surface measurements if only I could have measurement of the forces inside the Earth. And that's what they're trying to do at another earthquake hotspot thousands of miles away. Having witnessed the devastation in Haiti, I've come to a place with some geological similarities. A place where the risk of a major quake is just as great, if not greater. In California, Ernie Major and his team are placing instruments deep inside the Earth, where the seismic forces that cause earthquakes are born. We have a seismic source, and then we have a seismic receiver. In, uh, a source and receiver. A source and receiver. The tubes are placed in holes dug deep into the rock, 3,000 feet deep. Now, why 3,000 feet? Well, that's as deep as we can get. Imagine trying to see 3,000 feet, a half a mile underground. That's nine of the towers behind me stacked one on top of the other, drilled into solid rock. So, all right, hear that little pop, 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 pop. So that vibration goes out through the earth, and this oscilloscope here oh, yeah. is, is measuring the signal. In 2005 and 2006, while measuring stress along California's San Andreas Fault, Ernie's team got a reading that caught them by surprise. The audio pulses suddenly began to speed up. This happened just before a magnitude 3 earthquake. The chain started about 10 hours beforehand. This could be something people have sought for centuries, an earthquake warning sign, a way to predict when an earthquake is about to happen. So, have you been able to be consistent with this? If we hope to replicate this over the next year or so. We might be on the path or prediction. We don't know that yet. Earthquake prediction, to some extent, is the holy grail of the whole field. And nowhere are they searching harder for the holy grail than here in California. It's riddled with active geological faults, the most infamous being the San Andreas, which runs the length of the state and is one of the most studied faults in the world. Tom Jordan coordinates 600 scientists to produce an incredibly detailed, comprehensive earthquake forecast for California that maps out which communities are most at risk. It uses the historical information, it uses our mapping of faults, our understanding of the physics of earthquakes to estimate how frequently earthquakes will occur in California, where they're going to occur, how big they're going to be, and something about uh, you know the, the probabilities in a given time period. The result of all that research is this animated computer simulation. It shows in graphic and terrifying detail how tremors would spread from a rupture on the San Andreas Fault and move across Southern California. The earthquake has just begun down here on the southern end of the fault and is propagating up the fault at about 6,000 miles per hour. Notice how it turns and goes into the Los Angeles region. This is an area that's filled with very soft sediments and it conducts the energy very well. The simulation shows which neighborhoods are most at risk. I'm standing here in the Hollywood Hills just above the city of Los Angeles. In that simulated earthquake, there would be a shock wave that would go right by where I'm standing, and it would shake for about 20 seconds. That'd be bad. But because I'm standing on bedrock, I'm probably OK. About 80 seconds after the event began, uh, the strong shaking begins in Los Angeles. Below the hills, the flatlands will be hit hardest. This whole area sits on sediment, and there'll be an aftershake that lasts for several minutes. And that's where the damage will come. And as you can see, there's a lot here to be damaged. The 30-year forecast gives a 94% probability of California being hit by a quake as big as the one that hit Port-au-Prince. We just have to be prepared for that inevitability. And it is inevitable. It's it not... is inevitable. It is going to happen. Now, when it happens, we cannot say. We're still looking for the holy grail, predicting the exact timing of an earthquake. But our ability to forecast their size and location is already good and getting better. Armed with these long-term forecasts, people in earthquake-prone areas can take steps to prepare for the inevitable. The next big one. Are you going to take your chances and hope you luck out, or do you invest for the worst? We're playing a statistical game. It's a gambler's game. And frankly, nature has the odds.
all know it's dangerous to drive and do other stuff at the same time. Well, cars of the future might fix that. Correspondent Zia Tong ran down some folks designing a car that could make driving a whole lot safer because the car is a robot and we won't be behind the wheel. Driving today is a nightmare. From texting drivers to horrific traffic jams, the car, once our biggest convenience, is creating some of our biggest problems. Today, you see gridlock in a lot of major cities around the world. In Asia and Europe, traffic is moving at about five to 10 miles an hour, and people are stressed out. But what if you could redesign a car in a way that could do away with all that stress and gridlock? Auto engineers have come up with an idea embodied in this, a revolutionary new vehicle called the Envy. Now, when I typically picture a car, I think of like four wheels and a steering wheel, but what I'm looking at right now looks like it's more out of a video game. That's right. These vehicles are not cars in the traditional sense of the word. First of all, to get in, you pop the hood. Let's go for a cruise. Nice. You won't need to gas up ever again because these high-tech vehicles are electric-powered and can be charged in an ordinary outlet. No tailpipe and no toxic fumes. They're powered by two motors, one in each wheel. Top speed, about 25 miles per hour. They weigh less than 1,000 pounds, a quarter of your average car. And when it comes to maneuverability, these tiny two-seaters can turn on a dime. But there's one feature that makes these vehicles truly unique. So right now, you're just in auto drive mode, is that right? Yes. With the help of GPS, wireless, and sensing technology, the Envy can be driven hands-free along a pre-programmed route. The idea is you just get in, tell the car where you want to go, and it'll take you there. They can even drive on their own. No human required. That is incredible. That looks like a ghost car, though, the way it's driving itself, right? You know, it's actually a bit spooky. Spooky or not, it can also do this. Ah, oh, you're gonna crash! Stop by itself when something is in its path. The vehicles know each other's location and direction of movement and speed of movement. That's because sensors, equipped with vision and ultrasonic technology, give them the ability to sense objects around them. And a wireless network enables them to talk with one another, just like computers communicate through the internet. But instead of sending emails, they share their position and velocity. So right now, because this vehicle talked to the other vehicle, the other Envy, it right. saw us coming and it stopped. That's correct, yes. That's and great. So this would prevent accidents, then? This would prevent accidents. <laughs> And in theory, if cars never hit each other, they don't need to be designed like cars. You eliminate the airbags. You eliminate a huge plate of metal between you and the road. We do have seat belts in there for that inadvertent bump. Or let's say you, you're, you fall asleep, so you don't fall out of the seat. For its debut, three design teams from around the world were invited to create their vision of the car of the future. The vehicle that was designed in Europe, you know, they have all the runways in Milano and Paris. That vehicle is called the Fashionista. It has a very expensive aura to it. The blue bubble I rode in was designed in Australia. It's called cute and friendly. And the black one that looks a bit like Darth Vader was designed in California. That one we call the Techno Geek. Not only can fashionista, cute and friendly, and techno geek drive themselves, they can also pick you up. Well, the car of the future, like Envy, you call the vehicle and it will come to you. I just press this button and it will come and pick me up because walking to a car is so 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> this is so Convenient, much cooler than ballet. I love it. Chris hopes these cars will dominate cities of the future and make gridlock a thing of the past. What I would like to see by the year 2030 is that people would still have that freedom of movement that an automobile gives them today. But these vehicles would be communicating with each other and sensing each other, and traffic would flow a lot more smoothly, and people would be able to relax in the vehicle. But what really gets me excited is the fact that this vehicle could provide accessibility for people who currently don't have access to an automobile. I'm thinking of people who are old, people who are very young, and people who are disabled. When will the Envies be roadworthy? It's hard to say. There are many technical hurdles still to overcome. In fact, this poor little Envy ran out of steam right in the middle of our drive. And cars like this aren't equipped to drive on the highway alongside unpredictable humans. To be safe, the Envies will need roadways of their own, where cars, not people, are in control. Until then, cars like these will remain the stuff of automakers' dreams and designers' fantasies.
dreams about the future are always filled with gadgets. Already, we've got plenty. Smartphones, computers, tablets. And at the rate we're going, we're sure to get more. But all these wonders of technology rely on a tricky commodity, electricity. And the truth is, the system that powers all this stuff is on its last legs. Recharge battery. Recently, I met up with some people who are racing to reinvent the electrical lifeblood of our technological age. So that our visions for the future won't be left in the dark. I'm about to get a bird's eye view of the most interconnected machine on Earth. Made up of more than 5,000 power plants, 200,000 miles of transmission lines, delivering electricity to millions of American homes. A 20th century marvel of engineering, our electric grid. Oh, I'm looking at the network of transmission lines. They just go far and wide. Yes, they do. The electrical grid is basically an interstate for electricity, and it goes all over the whole country. The grid got its start during the Depression, when the federal government brought electricity to the heartland. But this century-old marvel of engineering is ill-equipped to handle the demands of an energy-hungry society. Not only is it dirty, about half of our electricity comes from coal-burning power plants that emit greenhouse gases. More than half of our energy is lost in the way we produce, transmit, and use it. According to Eric Leitner, director of the Federal Smart Grid Task Force, the best way to make our grid more efficient and tackle climate change is with a smart grid. Smart grid, that means oh. right now it's a dumb grid. Well, it's not as smart as it could be, let's just say that. <laughs> an underachieving grid. <laughs> yeah, there you go, an underachieving grid. There's no better place to see how the grid works and why it needs some smarts than here. Think air traffic control, but instead of coordinating 747s, these dispatchers monitor the flow of a dynamic and dangerous force that travels close to the speed of light. Electricity starts its journey to us from huge power plants like this, where first, coal is burned to heat water. The water turns to steam, which spins a turbine, that turns a generator, that forces tiny particles called electrons through a wire. That's electricity. No matter how you generate that flow of electrons, the amount has to be just right. That's because too few electrons can cause a blackout, and too many can fry your electronics. As demand increases or decreases, a power plant has to either go up or down to meet that demand. And you're monitoring this in real time? In real time. It's a very delicate balancing act. These dispatchers are desperately trying to maintain that delicate balance. Something just happened. For instance, in this drill, a generator has suddenly gone offline. Uh, we just lost a large unit in the West. These grid operators have only a few minutes to solve the problem, and they're forced to do it the old-fashioned way, by getting on the phone with power plants in search of more electrons. If they can't find them, they turn to power plants like this one. It's called a peaker plant, because it's only used during power peaks, about 100 hours a year. The rest of the time, plants like this are sitting around on standby, a wasteful and expensive way to produce energy. In fact, about 25% of the cost of producing electricity is spent keeping these plants on hold. But dispatchers don't have much of a choice. Frequency's back to normal. And here's where a smart grid could make a real difference. Starting with those old-fashioned power lines. At the Electric Power Research Institute, they're working on giving them some smarts. We're going to install sensor 460 on the closest line. This little sensor may not look high-tech, but it has the ability to analyze the condition of a power line. Going hot on four. For instance, when too many electrons flow through a power line, it gets so hot it starts to sag. Not only that. When a line sags, it gets closer to the ground, and therefore it gets closer to trees, and the electricity going down the line will now go down the tree. The result? A blackout, like the one in 2003 that shut down power to millions of people in eight states and parts of Canada. What caused the blackout in 2003? You can put it simply and say, there are some mischievous trees that decided to knock down some power lines. And at some level, that's true. But the deeper reason is that the grid operators or the utilities didn't have the technical capacity to tell them what was happening on their own power lines. Smart sensors like this can analyze the condition of a power line and send that information wirelessly to grid operators before the lights go out. But to make our grid truly efficient, it must undergo an even larger transformation. 
Imagine if the internet were to merge somehow with the dumb electricity grid we have. That's the kind of embedded intelligence a smart grid should have. Intelligence that starts at the power plant and travels all the way to your home. Here's how the grid of the future will work. Your electric company is going to swap your old meter with a smart meter equipped with wireless communication. All your appliances will also be smart. They'll be able to communicate with your meter, which in turn will be in constant contact with the grid. This two-way communication between your electric company and your home will enable the grid to actually ask you for help when it's running low on electrons. Let's say you're running your clothes dryer and your meter gets a signal that the grid needs power. It can turn down the heat, freeing up some electrons for use elsewhere. All that happens is your dryer will turn off the heat for 30 seconds. The drum will continue to spin. You will never even know that that event took place. The same thing will happen with your air conditioner, dishwasher, even your water heater. And when millions of homes with tens of millions of smart appliances do the same, dispatchers will have a whole new way to prevent blackouts and get more mileage out of the electricity we generate. There's no doubt that transforming the most interconnected machine on Earth into one of the smartest is a colossal task. But if we want to tackle global climate change and keep the lights on for generations to come, it's a challenge we'll have to face. Some people think the smart grid is such a huge project that it can't get done. But let's remember, energy is the biggest industry on Earth, by far. We can't live without it. Il primo esempio, e anche il più grande, di una rete intelligente si trova in Italia, dove l'85% delle case ha contatori intelligenti, la più alta percentuale al mondo. Con questo sistema si può controllare a distanza l'installazione della corrente, leggere i contatori e rilevare interruzioni del servizio. È veramente una grande svolta. Pretty much every plant and animal alive today is the result of eons of natural crossbreeding. We are, of course, the products of our parents, grandparents, and all our ancestors. This orange takes it a step further. It's the result of farmers intentionally crossbreeding different kinds of oranges to get bigger, juicier, tastier fruit. What they're doing is manipulating genes, DNA, instructions for all living things. But what if you could go even further and actually write genetic code from scratch? In this episode's profile, we meet one scientist who's trying to do just that, custom design totally new forms of life that one day might save the world. Jay Kiesling was raised to work the earth, but instead, this tough Nebraska farm boy might just save the world. And before you think talk like that's just a bunch of manure, well, Jay can tell you all about manure. We had 200 pigs. And with 200 pigs, there's a lot of manure. And uh, this was really hard work, scooping pig manure. It was no fun at all. Nobody enjoyed it. <laughs> and that was probably the worst job. I like to say that I spent the first 18 years of my life with uh, the smell of pig manure on my hands. Today, Jay's got plants, not pigs, and the manure isn't on his hands so much as it's on his mind. Jay Kiesling is a pioneer in the field of synthetic biology who's doing amazing things with the waste from bacteria. He's doing it here at the Bay Area's Joint Bioenergy Institute, or as everyone around here calls it, J-Bay, though they swear there's no pun intended. You could say the acronym a lot of different ways, but we happen to call it J-Bay. Nice to see you. How are you? Hmm, no matter what you think about the nickname, J-Bay starts with J. Jay is the hard-working CEO who pays attention to every detail, from lab work... What's uh, going on right now? ...to the method for hanging wall posters. What you should do is make sure that they have a, two clips and two wires for each poster. <laughs> <laughs> and who says I don't micromanage? <laughs> Actually, Jay is a microbe manager. His first major victory was engineering E. coli, bacteria found in everyone's gut, to produce a drug that will help cure malaria. Malaria kills nearly a million people each year, or a child in Africa every 45 seconds. It's a terrible drain on a nation's productivity, and it can be cured by a drug called artemisinin, which comes from a plant that can be difficult to grow, so it can be very expensive to produce. 
and the price was too high for people to afford. Jay saw the perfect opportunity to engineer bacteria to squirt out artemisinin. I view microbes as little chemical factories. We're doing the same thing inside the cell. It's just billions of times smaller. And here's how Jay and his team set out to build a microbial factory for the anti-malarial drug. They wrote new genetic code. Then, machines assembled it from the four basic chemical ingredients of DNA. They took those synthesized genes and mixed them with genes from yeast and other bacteria to re-engineer the insides of E. coli. And it worked. With custom-made microbes, the life-saving anti-malarial drug can be produced so efficiently, a dose will cost pennies instead of dollars. We could save on the order of 500,000 lives a year. It really set Jay apart from the rest of the field in using synthetic biology as a way to tackle some of the biggest problems that are out there. Jay got a $43 million grant from the Gates Foundation and started a company to find ways to take his innovations from the microbe to the market. It was clearly one of the most exciting periods of my life. Jay had matched his renowned imagination with his prodigious work ethic. Even late at night, he problem solved during his workout. And with two young sons, Jay is determined to take on other challenges facing our planet. For his next mission, he's reaching back to the roots of his ambition and optimism, back where it all started, on the farm. My work now relates much more to the farm than it ever has. Life in Harvard, Nebraska, as in many small farm towns today, is challenging. Jay remembers his childhood fondly, though it was challenging too. It was actually a great place to grow up. My father was very quiet, extremely hardworking. From my mother, I think I got a lot of determination, um, uh, strong will, uh, focus. I think it's been really important for me. Jay's mother died when he was only 11 years old. I remember it clearly. She was, she'd had cancer, breast cancer, has been cured of it, or it was in remission at least, uh, coming home from her last doctor's appointment. Uh, corn was very tall, so it's hard to see cars coming. Uh, she crossed from stopping a stop sign, was hit by another car, and that car was driven by her first cousin. Both of them died. Um, so pretty tragic for our family. It was a tough time of our life. It, it really was. We just survived, and uh, we got along. You know, you just and do what you have to do. Jay was old enough that he really knew. You know, he was 11 years old. Him and his mother were really close. And uh, as we all were, but it was, it was tough on Jay. I had to work even harder. It was very little time for uh, fun and games. Um, and, and that's actually OK. That served me pretty well, I think. Um, because right now, there's pretty much no amount of work that seems insurmountable for me. And work hard, he did. Jay became class valedictorian. The small town couldn't hold his ambition. But he was driven to leave by another reason, one that he kept secret. Being gay in, in small town Nebraska is, is difficult. Um, uh, people who were, if there were any, were certainly not out. And so you had no examples at all. Throughout college in Lincoln, while getting his PhD at Michigan, Jay never told his family he was gay. He didn't come out until he arrived at Berkeley. My father was fine with it. And just accepted it. He's my son, you know. It shouldn't matter uh, what ethnicity, um, what sexual preference you are, uh, anything. It's all about the work. Now, the mixture of Jay's famous drive and tolerance has led him to design a highly unusual team reflecting those qualities. There, working side by side, are engineers, biologists, chemists, all working around the clock under the same roof. My background is chemistry. I'm actually a graduate student in the Department of Bioengineering. He hires people that are strong in their fields and expect them to take ownership of their project and get it done. Jay has assembled a multidisciplinary team every bit as driven as he is to work on his next big vision. Their mission? Solving the world's energy crisis by manipulating bacteria to produce biofuels that will replace oil. Petroleum's running out, um, and it's going to run out even faster the more the population starts to drive, the more economies grow. This is biodiesel that's being secreted by uh, e. e. coli. Jay and his team have already engineered the DNA of E. coli to produce biodiesel from switchgrass. See those little bubbles right there? That's actually fuel. Straight from bacteria, ready for a car. And that could just be siphoned off and put into a tank. 
They've demonstrated the concept of turning sugar from switchgrass into biofuel. And the next step is figuring out how to make the process practical on an enormous scale, one big enough to save the world. And by planting all the switchgrass to make this new biofuel, it might just save places like Harvard, Nebraska, and the farm that's been in Jay's family for five generations. Someday, these fields will be planted with switchgrass, and these bales will be the cellulose that goes in to the fermentation facility that produces our advanced biofuels. Biofuels that will feed our cars, our planes, our factories. This is the future of energy for the U.S. What Jay's doing now could help us a great deal in the future. We could raise lots of acres of switchgrass. And it, he seems to be pretty positive about that. That's a good idea. We're trying to make the Midwest into the new Mideast. And from around these parts, that would definitely be the next big thing. And now for some final thoughts on the next big thing. For most of human civilization, the pace of innovation has been so slow that a generation might pass before a discovery would influence your life, culture, or the conduct of nations. Today, and for a while now, we've come to expect major changes several times within a decade, especially among the developed countries. Some are big and obvious, like the invention of the telephone, the car, the airplane, or the computer. Some are big, but unfold slowly. Electrified cities and countrysides, access to abundant supplies of food, or the countless ways we now communicate with one another. Some of my favorite big things are the accumulation of little things, like the unending role of composite materials in our lives or the steady growth and power of the internet. More often than not, the next big thing takes you by surprise. You don't see it coming. You don't know or believe you need it. Then, the inevitable happens. You can't live without it. A last category of big thing comes from the discovery of ideas or perspectives. In 1968, Apollo 8 was the first spacecraft to ever leave Earth for another destination, the moon. Astronauts on board didn't land, but looped around the backside and snapped a photo of Earthrise over the barren lunar landscape. It took a voyage of the moon to see Earth for the first time. Enlightened and empowered by that single image, we transformed the way we care for our planet, which may just be the biggest thing of them all. And that is the cosmic perspective. And now we'd like to hear your perspective on this episode of Nova Science Now. Log on to our website and tell us what you think. You can watch any of these stories again, download additional audio and video, explore interactives, hear from experts, and watch revealing profiles from our web-only series, The Secret Life of Scientists and Engineers. Find it all at pbs.org. That's our show. We'll see you next time. See a hidden side of science on NOVA's web-exclusive series, The Secret Life of Scientists and Engineers. Think you know scientists? Think again. NOVA's The Secret Life of Scientists and Engineers. This NOVA Science Now program is available on DVD at shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS.